Right, so there's been a lot of talk recently, a lot of people talking about fake alien um, landings or stuff, you know, like disclosure and all this, but it's going to be fake. That's, um, that's apparently imminent with people like Obama and stuff talking about it, um, involving the whole weird stuff that's going on in the world these days. Uh, people think it's going to culminate in um, an alien invasion or a fake alien invasion. So I was thinking about this and I dug out um, Constance E. Cumbie's A Planned Deception, The Staging of a New Age Messiah, which was written in 1985. And um, I thought, all oh, right, I know, I'm going to go through this and I'll do a review of it. And then I thought, you know what, like the just having a look at it, the chapters are pretty short, so I thought, um, I'm just going to go through the whole thing, because there's 16 chapters, and um, an introduction, and they're, they're pretty short, so I'm just going to go through it, um, so let's go. <laughs> introduction. Since my first book, The Hidden Dangers of the Rainbow, was published in 1983. My life has been anything but n normal. I probably have 35 feet of unopened mail gracing my office. I have probably answered another, another 35 feet. It is not uncommon for me to receive more mail in the average day than I used to get in an average month as a practicing attorney. And practicing attorneys do not receive a lot of mail. Often, I have felt that I had a per permanent case of jet lag that would never go away. My phone continues to ring con constantly with sincere people besieging me for updated information. Computerising my unstaffed office helped a little, but only a little. It did indeed substantially ease the research and writing portions of my work. However, it still could not open up my voluminous voluminous mail I resisted resorting to the computerized form letters I so despised receiving so far if somebody were to receive a reply from me it was actually from me not from an unthinking machine or an assistant in other ways the publication of the book made my work much easier of the mail that did get opened and I'm still working on and treasuring the balance that did not a significant portion of the documentation in this book was extracted, this book. I will forever be grateful to the unknown benefactor who sent me a voluminous packet on the Club of Rome, planetary citizens and other New Age groups. The documentation was so priceless, I wanted to write and thank that person, whoever he or she was. I was unable to do so because inside was a note that merely said, to thank the Holy Spirit. I do, and I also hope that the person seek, sending it knows they have my thanks as well. Then there was the painful matter of the public criticism. I received it from two sources, from the ranks of the New Ages and from some within the Christian community. The first I anticipated. The second I also should have expected, but that did not ease its sting. For a very long period of time, I had to endure suggestions from Christian magazines that perhaps I had invented the New Age movement. I replied that I wished I had, because then I could make it go away. <laughs> then, perhaps my critics either partially awakened or realised they could not just make the movement and the growing recognition of it by Christians go away. With that came an apparent second strategy from my critics, one of subtle redefinition. Articles and books would be written and conferences and seminars held that would acknowledge the New Age movement's existence. I would recognise much that appeared to be my research in them, but there would be no mention of the work of myself or co-labourer David Hunt. I was not discouraged by the lack of acknowledgement for as the Apostle Paul said, for whatever motive they are preaching the gospel, still the gospel is being preached. 
but I was agitated by consistent by a consistent pattern of the same two jokes. Oh, she's not ended the quote there. Recurring time and time again in these efforts to expose the movement by my critics. While our work was not mentioned per se, the articles would contain a vague hint that perhaps there were extremists in the evangelical world claiming the New Age movement had something to do with the Antichrist. And most certainly they would say it was not in the church, particularly not in the evangelical church. To reiterate, these statements have to either be jokes or deliberate deceptions. There is absolutely no way one can completely research the New Age movement and not discover that its major purpose is bringing in a new world order headed by the Antichrist. As Donald Keyes, a former Lucis Trust employee, as well as being a planetary initiative, world federalist and sane leader says, quote, don't think that for one minute you can have a world government without a head, close quotes. I also faced the disillusionment of hearing people I formerly admired tell outright falsehoods. Two who are widely respected in the field of cults made frequent statements on their radio programmes that they invited me on their programmes and I refused the invitations. They had never done so. Worse yet, one of these gentlemen sat in the front row of one of my speaking engagements in Southern California and did not even introduce himself to me. I did not even know he was in the audience until others, labouring in the same field and disturbed by his vitriolic conduct, informed me he was there the entire evening. Thereafter, he made even legally ac actionable slanderous statements about my work on his own radio programme. He would follow these remarks by telling his listening audience he was going to send me the tapes. He further said that he would have me on his programme in a week or two to respond to his charges. The next week he would go back on the air and tell his listeners I had refused the opportunity to respond over the air. I have yet to receive a single tape or talk show invitation from this individual whose work I once so deeply admired. This dis disillusionment hurt me far more than Benjamin Crane's sarcastic remarks about me on yet other radio programmes. I went to one of Benjamin Crane's lectures years ago in London, about 1992. I have thrilled, however, at the grace and protection the Lord has provided me in my work of uncovering the New Age movement. Time after time, as I would confront the critics... I would discover that I, in packing my briefcase for a lonely and often harsh encounter far from home, had included the exact documentation needed for what was thrown at me. Out of a library of several thousand books, I do not need to tell you how statistically improbable that was. In moving from my downtown Detroit office in a de deteriorating building to a suburban location, I was amazed that God answered my prayers to keep the elevator in working order until the move was completed. I'd seen the elevator fail under better conditions and its brakes were obviously failing this time. On moving day there was nearly three feet of water in the elevator shaft. It was performing in an erratic fashion. The movers made countless runs downstairs from my fifth floor suite. After making my final trip to retrieve my coat, purse and princess, a cat, serving as my mouse of officer mouser, I took final leave of my old office. The next day I learned that a remaining building tenant on the very next elevator run, after my last one, experienced brake failure. Failing to stop at the sixth floor, it instead took him to the top floor of a ten-storey building. Thereafter, it failed to operate at all. I knew God had answered my prayer for safety while completing the move of my office and library. A month after I vacated the building, the owner, a former law school classmate, telephoned me. He had said that someone had broken into and vandalised the entire fifth floor where my former office had been located. The floor had thoroughly been looted. Even the built-in filing cabinets and bookcases had been removed. Had I still been there, I would have lost everything. 
In a dangerous section of downtown Detroit, all I ever lost from theft were a set of rubber bumpers from the rear of my car. This was no small miracle, considering that this part of downtown, including the lot where I parked, was plagued by vandalism and car theft. The private lot from my office building had itself been the scene of many such crimes. The New Age movement has been a source of much frustration to me. At the same time, viewing it from the vantage point, I have definitely not been boring. It, sorry, it has definitely not been boring. Seeing its prophetic and historic implications in context make me realise that we are fortunate to live in a time that all the Old Testament prophets would have loved to see. For those who understand Jesus' words to his disciples are appropriate. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. Matthew thirteen sixteen, King James Version. However, if one persists in closing his eyes to the existence of the all too plain evidence, they might instead consider the following passages. And he said, Go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. Many shall be purified and made white and tried, but the wicked shall do wickedly and block capitals, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. Daniel 12, 9 to 10. O ye hypocrites, ye can discern the face of the sky, but can ye not discern the signs of the times? Matthew 16, 3. And with all the dis deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion, and they should believe a lie, that they might all be damned who believe believed not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Thessalonians 2, 10 to 12. That's a bit, sounds a bit harsh, like people being judged because they've been deceived. A bit harsh. Anyway. Here one must see that the important thing was the love of the truth. She's talking now. The emphasis was not so much on perfect truth as it was this love of the truth. No doubt every hypocrite and Pharisee who harassed Jesus believed himself to be in possession of perfect truth. And yet Jesus' scornful remarks were Jesus' scornful remarks were directed directly to them. No doubt many a person in Noah's day felt himself to be a good person, but he would not heed the warning the Lord gave Noah that a disaster would come upon the earth. Let us not take the proud Pharisees as our role models. It is better that we model ourselves after the humility of that repentant thief hanging alongside Jesus on a companion cross, saying, Lord, remember, remember me when you come into your kingdom. To trust in our own righteousness is just as fatal a sin of pride as that committed by Lucifer when he desired to attain God's position. As the angel said to John, let he who has ears hear. My notion of an ideal career has never been to walk about with a giant sign saying, repent, the end is near. But still the signs of the times indicate that indeed we should repent as the end is near. The sequel to The Hidden Dangers of the Rainbow are about those signs and hidden dangers to which we must remain alert. Constance E. Cumby, November 1, 1985. So tomorrow, we'll get straight into it, chapter 1. <laughs>